here. I am Bart Loser. I am the program director for our continuing education program. And this is one of our usually uh, we're doing pretty much on a weekly basis, different types of educational programs on various different topics, such as leadership, basic membership skills. Uh, we have a pathways uh, program that we do once a month. So if you will go to the continuing education section of our district website, tmd55.org. You can find out more about upcoming programs. And most all of our programs are recorded. So you can go back to our resource library and find out more about those programs as well. I'm very excited to have a great program lined up for you from someone I'm incredibly impressed with from our last presentation that we had, which was which Chuck had done. Uh, and so we, those, those that program is also available to you on the well, it will be going up in terms of our resource library, but our speaker today is Chuck Hinkle. And Chuck began his Toastmaster career in Southwestern Toastmasters in Houston in 1982. He has started five clubs and been president of six. He says his favorite part of meetings is the evaluation. And he competed in evaluation contests at the club, area, division, and district level and has published an article in the Toastmasters magazine and spoken on the topic for Toastmasters University in District 56. He currently is a member of Northwest Toastmasters in San Antonio and is speaking tonight on improving evaluations. Please help me welcome Chuck Hinkle. Yay. Chuck. Thank you very much, Bart. So it's true, I believe that Evaluation is the most important part of Toastmasters and my favorite. It's the nucleus of everything good in Toastmasters. Without it, we're just a group of people who like to meet and tell stories to one another. We have three topics that I plan to cover today. I'm going to talk about the value of, of evaluations, then the role of the evaluator, and then how do we evaluate effectively. So I'll begin by asking you, who benefits from good evaluations? You can put that in the chat room or unmute yeah. yourself. Oh, I can't see the chat, so mm -hmm. unmute yourself, please. Yeah. Who do you think? Who benefits from good evaluations? And Dottie says, we all do. Stephen Hall says, yeah. everybody. Tween right. Nguyen also says, everyone. We all Very benefit. good. I'm going to narrow you down a little bit and begin by saying that the speaker gets a lot of benefit from good evaluations. For one thing, they get direct feedback. They've given their speech, they sit down and somebody gives them immediate feedback. So they hear about the speech itself. It paves the way to better speaking skills because as an evaluator, we're giving them specific ways to improve from this point on. And it also reinforces that speaker's commitment to better speaking by oftentimes by pointing out the things they've accomplished to this point. So who else benefits from good evaluations besides just the speaker? Who would you say? Well, in clubs, I'd say it's the members themselves. They, they, they learn a lot about how, what to look for, what to listen for, uh, and how to evaluate well. And they learn to become better speakers, even though the evaluation is for that particular speaker. Very good answer. I'll come back to that one. I'm going to list one we may have skipped a bit. The evaluator themselves get a lot of benefit from good evaluations. I'd say this is our opportunity to help other people. And there's a satisfaction to seeing the people that you evaluate, see them improve over time. People say to me, why are you still in Toastmasters after all this time? Haven't you gotten it right yet? And Feeling is from being able to help the people around me feel that I'm helping them improve and seeing that improvement. It enhances the confidence then also for the evaluator to be able to say what you think. I remember being in a chatting with my boss once and he told me, I really admire something about you. It's always is a good thing when you're a boss admires something about you, but he admired that I'm able to say what I think. And I felt that comes from evaluation skills. It also builds analytical skills. You've got to listen and make decisions. And it certainly builds impromptu skills. You think table topics is hard. Well, that's just fluff. Evaluation is just as 
on the spot, plus it has a lot of impact and meaning to it. Now, you've already mentioned who else benefits from good evaluations, the club itself. It builds a positive climate when you're giving good evaluations. You feel the support and the camaraderie of the rest of the group when you see a speaker getting that type of evaluation. It develops good speaking role models. So when you have guests come in, or even you as a newer Toastmaster, perhaps, you have a chance to say, wow, look at that, that speaker is so terrific, it's so awesome. I wanna be like that speaker. I wanna join this club and keep coming to meetings. And that comes from their improvement due to good evaluations. It creates a success oriented atmosphere. The whole club can feel itself improving as a body and want to continue coming to meetings and attending. It keeps people coming to meetings, as I say. I tell the story about Texas Talkers. That was a 40 plus club that met at Sharpstown Mall in Houston on Wednesday nights when I first joined Toastmasters. They were featured on a, on a TV talk show one Sunday morning. They were like the one of the premier clubs in Houston. Bill Winter was the president and became an area governor. And then after just one year, the club practically folded and eventually did fold. They went dropped down below 10 members. And I asked him what happened to the club? And he said, we stopped giving good evaluations. Every evaluation was basically the same. This was terrific, you were wonderful. I really enjoyed the speech and I can hardly wait to hear you give it one again. Eventually the speakers stopped practicing so much because it didn't matter. They were going to get the same evaluation anyway. They didn't improve as much as they expected to. They felt that they weren't getting value out of Toastmasters and they drifted away and the club died because of bad evaluations. And there's one more group, which is very unobvious, who benefits from good evaluations. And that's your work team. I don't know if, how many of you might be on self-directed or empowered teams. The phrase is always changing, but it's basically a team that works together. Think about the opportunities that a good evaluation gives if you are part of a team like that. For one, maybe you're involved with 360 degree peer evaluations where you're expected to give evaluations or maybe help provide performance ranking rating for the people on your team. Good evaluators can also improve conflict resolution on teams. And overall, it builds stronger team members. Think about what skills do you get as an evaluator? You become a better speaker. You become a better problem analyzer. You become a better advisor. Who doesn't want to be on a team filled with people who are really excellent at those skills? That's the lead and that should get you the feeling, I want to be a good evaluator. Good evaluator. I want our club to have good evaluators. Let's move from that. Now talk about the three roles of an evaluator. The first role is gonna be a motivator. As a motivator, you point out the improvement and you reinforce the desire for someone to continue give, we're giving speeches and working to improve themselves. Talk about what they've done so far. I can see that you've overcome the nervous gestures that you used to have. I found that your gestures are really strong and relevant. So you're always pointing out improvement and you're encouraging the speakers to continue. A good evaluator is also a facilitator because you'll be telling people how to improve. Here's what I see you doing well. Here's the next thing I want you to work on though. And the third role is one that you don't often see. You don't have to do this one very much. You may have to be a counselor. So these are special circumstances. The case that I always remember, we had a club president at Southwestern, his name was John Sari, and he was giving his 10th speech. Now back in the old book, that meant this was the final speech to earn his CTM. And it was a very important speech, therefore. He got up and gave the speech, or was going to give the speech, he had memorized it, and he started 
and it was about his father. And I could tell it was very emotional. He got a couple of lines in and he was fumbling and he lost it. It was gone. He apologized and went and sat down and there was some nervous applause. And he said, okay, wait, let me go again. I've got it. He got the introduction again. He walks up confidently and he didn't get as far this time as he did even the first time. And he sat back down. If you think about it, that evaluator had a lot of mechanical improvements that he could have commented on to help the speaker. But I give special credit to the evaluator and really admire the person. I don't remember who it is, and I wish I did, because the evaluator didn't focus on any of those speech improvements. Instead, he reminded John that this was a 10th speech he had already proven that he was a very good speaker and a competent speaker, that he recognized that this was a difficult topic for him, especially for such a meaningful presentation. And he challenged him to go ahead, not for the next week, because give, give yourself a chance to step back from this event, but go talk to the EVP, get on the schedule for two weeks from now, and I want you to come back and I expect it to be wonderful. And I was fortunate to be at the meeting a couple of weeks later when John was at the meeting and gave that speech again, and it was the best speech he'd ever given. I credit a lot of that to that evaluator who did the counseling approach instead of the, here's what you did wrong and how to improve approach. I admire all the evaluators though, not just that one, but I admire them all because really evaluation is the toughest job in Toastmasters. How do you share the advice? If you're too soft and too much of a marshmallow, you don't help anyone. If you're too harsh, well, someone feels that they've been rejected. They may never ask again for your evaluation, they may even give up. I, I flunked Toastmasters, I did such a terrible job. So you've got this balancing act in a sense and too hard, too soft, it's not an easy balance to traverse. Fortunately, I learned a topic called descriptive feedback. I compare it to being dealt a winning hand of four aces. And it's gotten me through giving evaluations all these years. And that's what I wanna talk about next are the four rules of descriptive feedback. Each ace becomes a rule. Our first ace is the ace of spades, which is the most important ace. And the maximum that goes with the ace of spades is speak for yourself, not for the group. Speak for yourself, not for the group. Your job as an evaluator is to be a critical reporter. You are going to say what you see and you aren't going to worry about how anyone else sees it. That means that you can describe exactly what you see and nobody can argue and say you're wrong because you're going to be giving your personal opinion, not anyone else's opinion. It's okay to say, I really got bored by your speech. I'm sorry, I, I got lost. I didn't know where you were going. But you can't tell other people, or you can't tell the speaker, you lost your audience. Your audience couldn't follow along because you don't know how anyone else thinks. So if you give me as an evaluator and say, I couldn't follow your organization. I got lost. I didn't know what was coming next. Now, maybe everyone else, when they turn in their, their evaluation says, this was so easy to follow. This is a wonderful organization for this presentation. Great job. Was the evaluator wrong? No, because the evaluator honestly got lost somewhere. Perhaps the person missed the one critical forecasting statement at the end of the introduction that laid out, here are the three things I'm going to talk about. And next time I give a speech, I may come over to that evaluator and when I get to that most important line and look directly to make sure that the evaluator hears it next time. So you speak for yourself, not for the group. 
Our second ace is the ace of hearts, which reminds us to talk to the heart. Don't make the speaker allege your intent. Don't make the speaker allege your intent. Ooh, alleged intent, that sounds uh, scary, doesn't it? The reason I say talk to the heart is, as an evaluator, I've got this analysis I've done. I know what was done wrong. I know how to help them do better. And I'm talking to the brain. But you know what part of the speaker is often listening? It's the heart. You have to talk to the heart and don't make the speaker allege your intent. What's alleged intent? Sitcoms love to use alleged intent. So let me give you a typical scenario from a comedy show on TV. Now, since I'm old, all of my TV references are also very old. But in this show, the main character, Richie, has a couple of friends and one of his friends has a girlfriend. And the other friend is coming over to Richie's house at the very beginning of the show. And he looks up in the window and he sees the other friend's girlfriend with her arms around Richie. Richie is stealing the girlfriend. So for the next 25 minutes, the two friends do funny things trying to spy on Richie. And then finally, in that last five minutes after the last commercial, we learn that she's knitting a sweater as a Christmas present for her boyfriend. And she was using Richie to try to get the measurements. What happened? friend saw an event, interpreted it the way he had saw it, and didn't check it out. The same thing can happen to you with your speakers when you're an evaluator. Don't give them the chance to misinterpret what you're saying. For instance, maybe I evaluate, or maybe Wendy from my club gives me an evaluation, and she says, Chuck, your conclusion really wasn't very good this week. And I hear her, and what I'm feeling though is, hmm, last time I evaluated her, I told her her introduction should have been better. She's just getting even with me. I'm alleging her intent. But what she can do to avoid that is give me something like, Chuck, I really liked your introduction, and I, it caught my attention, laid things out well, your examples were terrific. They were fine. They were relevant and fresh. You were moving along well. I really was enjoying it. And then you got to the conclusion and it, you, it just ended too abruptly. You didn't summarize. You didn't have a call for action. You didn't have any kind of wrap it up. It felt like you ran, saw the red light perhaps or ran out of time. Now, what do I think? I'm thinking, oh, I see what she means. She's not letting me interpret what she's telling me the way I want to interpret it. I'm hearing why she believes it, not just the conclusion. So don't make the speaker allege your intent. Our third ace is the ace of diamonds. She reminds us to make our evaluations valuable. We do that by focusing on the act, not on the person. Focus on the act, not on the person. What's that mean? Let's say that you're doing your taxes and you've got a card table up and you've got all these receipts on it and you've been writing notes on your paper and you're getting there. It's not fun, but you're making progress. And you've got a child who's happy to see you and is bringing you a glass of Coke and runs into the room and trips and knocks over the table and the receipts go everywhere and the Coke goes on all the papers. And what are you going to say? The teachers in my clubs have agreed that if you continuously tell a child how stupid or bad he is, eventually they begin to believe it and act that way. Focus on the act though, not on the person. When I was a member of Southwest, I remember giving a speech and my evaluator was Ken Anderson. Well, back then I worked at the Shell IC. It was the information center, but it was also known as the informal center. So I came from there and I didn't have a tie. Ken evaluated me and said, Chuck, when you speak without a tie, you look 
very unprofessional. You see what he just did there? He didn't focus on me. If he had focused on me, he might have said, Chuck, you are such a slob. Look at you up there. You're not even wearing a tie. But by focusing on the act, the absence of a tie, he gave me a way to improve. And Ken, wherever you are, I've got my tie on. So we focus on the act, give people a way to improve, make that evaluation valuable. We don't focus on the person in themselves. Our final ace is the ace of clubs. We want to use the club itself. And the meaning is in the relationship, not in the dictionary. The meaning is in the relationship, not in the dictionary. One of my good friends who I met when I interviewed at Shell originally 40 years ago, and he was the best man at my wedding. Let's say that our wives are out of town or are doing something some night, and I decide I'm going to call up Tony. Am I going to say, Tony, friend, dear friend, wonderful person, I love spending time with you. Why don't you share some of your quality time, come over, and we'll have a pizza together. Be real. No. I'm going to say something like, hey, loser, instead of burning dinner tonight, why don't you come over here and we'll get a pizza. If you go to the dictionary and look up the word loser, it's not going to be very flattering. But Tony's not offended. I hope. He's big Tony, he's very tall. It's because of our relationship, that term loser no longer is a, a term of disdain. It almost has become a term of affection. It's something I can get away calling you loser. You can call me scum face, whatever, but we know that we're teasing each other and we like spending time together. The same type of thing in your club setting. Because of the club, we have a relationship between the evaluator and the speaker. The, evalu the speaker knows that you as an evaluator are going to give him honest feedback. You want him to do even better next time. You aren't trying to make him look bad. You're not trying to get a promotion over them. You're not trying to get his project shut down and your project approved. The only goal you have is to help him do better in his next speech. Because of that, you can come and be very honest and forthright, more so than you could just in many other situations, because this is a Toastmasters club, because we have that relationship of club member to club member, of evaluator to speaker. The meaning is in the relationship, not in the dictionary. What have we done? We talked about the importance of evaluation. You all are ready to be good evaluators. We've talked about how to present the evaluation, which is using descriptive feedback. Let's talk about methods of evaluation. I know of three methods that I recommend for giving a good evaluation. People say you can't prepare an evaluation. It's like an intro, it's like an impromptu speech, right? Like table topics. You just listen and then get it up and give it. No, you can prepare your evaluation. You can decide ahead of time how you want to organize your evaluation. And I say there are three good methods. The first one is you can trace the presentation and cover it in the same order that the speaker did. First, I'll talk about the introduction, then I'll talk about the transition, I'll talk about the first point, the second point, the third point, and then I'll end up with the conclusion. The advantage is it's very easy for the speaker to follow along because you're giving your comments in the same order that he gave his presentation. Second choice is what I call the three column approach. I had an advanced speaker in one of my clubs in Southwestern use this. She would take her paper and make three columns. In the first column, she would list what I liked. In the middle column, she would list what she didn't like. And in the third column, for everything in column two, she would say, here's how to move it from column two to column one. And then when she did the 
evaluation, she would go through her three columns. And then her conclusion was always a word of encouragement. And then there's the third type, which is the method that I use, which I say is the categorization method. I always talk about, I'm gonna talk about your speech. I have two things to evaluate. I'm gonna talk about your content and your delivery. Sometimes I get creative and I decide to talk about your delivery and your content, but I put everything into those two buckets. I'll talk about first one, then the other. And then at the end, my conclusion will be, did you fulfill your purpose? Those are three approved ways of organizing your evaluation. I also have a few things that I say do not do. Here's the don't, do not retell the speech. Maybe you've heard speakers, they evaluators, they get up and they'll say, I really especially like the story where, and they'll repeat the story. Well, guess what? The speaker knows the story. He told it in the first place. He doesn't need you to repeat it for him. Do not debate the speech. I've heard maybe it was a controversial topic or maybe it was a topic that the evaluator had special knowledge about, special expertise, but the evaluator would get up and say, oh, I think you need to check your facts on this and go off on why the speech was wrong. It doesn't matter. That doesn't help the speaker improve. You can give that content in a separate conversation after the meeting, but the purpose of the evaluation is to help them do a better presentation. So we don't debate the speech. Third thing is what I call gushing or ignoring the speech. Usually I've heard that either from people who don't know how to do an evaluation, or if they just want to score good points with the speaker. Maybe it's someone attractive and they want, are hoping to ask them for a drink later, which I saw happen. But it's, they'll just say, oh, it was wonderful. You did this well, you did this well, you did this well, and may even ignore the speech itself. Just talk about how wonderful the speaker is. And then the fourth thing I see sometimes in contests, they'll use a canned evaluation. The speech itself is just kind of a vehicle to get to the evaluation. The evaluator is practiced and prepared and is hoping to look good in a contest. And it doesn't help the speaker at all because everything is already, I, the way I've heard this is usually, I see you do this. That's an important thing to be able to do because, and then go off into a, a paragraph on why this specific skill is such a good skill to have in speeches, which doesn't help this particular speaker. So those are the things I say don't do when you're investigating or when you're planning your method of evaluation. We talked about why to be a good evaluator. We talked about how to present. We talked about how to organize. Maybe you're thinking something's missing. Maybe we should talk about what to actually look for in the speech. I would say a lot of it, go through the purpose of, especially beginning speeches, but what are the things that we talk about in speeches, um, in the manual and in pathways? So first thing is content, content and organization. As I say, my categorizations, I'll group things into content and delivery and the content will include organization. So think about the introduction. Introductions, was it too short or was it too long? Was it pertinent to the rest of the speech? Did it get people's attention? Does it forecast what's going to come along? And here's one interesting one. Was it the most effective introduction you think that's possible? What I mean by that is I've heard sometimes what I think is a very adequate introduction. Maybe it was a quotation. And I thought it did well, but I'll suggest that maybe telling a story would have been even more effective. Sometimes I'll even ask the audience, get their feedback. What do you all think? Would that have been more useful? Second thing, then after the introduction, talk about the body of the speech. 
What about the points the person made? Were they clear? Were the points supported reasonably with either facts or stories? Did the person use fresh, relevant examples? How were the transitions from one point to another? And did the person follow the forecast? If he says he's going to talk about A, B, and C, did he talk about A, B, and C? And in that order. And then when you get to the conclusion, was it, again, was it too long or too short? Did it have a strong statement? Did it summarize? Did it introduce new material? That's something we don't want to do in conclusions. And again, was it the most effective conclusion possible? And then some other things along content to look, think about the word choice. Were the, was the vocabulary too complex for this audience or was it just right? How about word choice itself in terms of the color of words? I've heard some speeches which were amazingly descriptive because of the words that they chose to use to describe a scenario. This all comes down to some audience analysis. And can you see evidence of audience analysis where the person is taking into account who's in my audience and speaking appropriately to that group? On the delivery side, what are some things to look for? Signs of nervousness to distract your audience and interfere with the message. So you've got the typical swaying back and forth, which eventually people start getting hypnotized by, or you see pacing. We don't want to do pacing and we may call that out. May do the, the gripping of the lectern. I, okay, as long as I have my death grip on this lectern and I'm not gonna let go. Are there any other disturbing or interfering habits that take your attention away from the speaker? A common one with men, especially if they have pockets and they don't know what to do with their hands, the hands may end up in the pockets. Oh, you can't see my pockets today. If I was standing in front of you, you'd know what I meant. And once they get in the pockets, oh, there's some keys in there. And they start jingling keys. If you're in the back of the room, it probably doesn't matter. But if you're up front, you can hear those. Mm -hmm. How about eye contact? Do you have a speaker who didn't leave the script? And eventually, I'll may look up every now and then, but I'm just going to read what it says here. And if I don't have to look at you, better for me. Did you face the audience or did you face the slides? You are more persuasive than the, than the slides are. You need to be looking at the audience. Did you focus on people in general or did you focus on maybe a specific person or maybe even concentrate on a specific spot? I don't know about you, but when I took speech in junior high, the teacher said, uh, if you're nervous, don't look at the people. Just look at a spot on the back wall, stare at that spot, and it'll be kind of, it'll be okay. Everyone will kind of think that you're looking at them. But you know, I can do that. And when I do this presentation in person, I ask people, you can tell I'm not looking at you, right? Right. You can talk about the voice itself. Was it loud enough? Did they vary in intensity? Was it monotone through the whole thing like I do a lecture? Was it at a good rate? Did the rate vary as it got exciting or maybe as I wanted to be dramatic and make a point? Overall, kind of what we're after these days as speakers, depending on the speech, is to be conversational. So was it conversational? As a, was the speaker conversational? You can comment on gestures. I tend to feel that Bad gestures are more distracting than good gestures are helpful. So I'll especially look about look for gestures to avoid and point it out if I see them. For instance, there's that, what do I do with my hands? There's the, the fig leaf or the reverse fig leaf. Neither of them looks very inviting or looks like you're very confident. Do you have, do you use both of your hands effectively or does one hand do all these impressive gestures, they're strong and forceful, and the other hand is just limp there and people start wondering, was it caught in an industrial accident or, or something? Why is it just not being used? Do you have natural gestures or are they very mechanical? My first point, am I a second point? Am I third point? How about making sure that the gestures are correct? I ran down the stairs. You may be laughing at some of these, but I've seen all these things in speeches. All of these are real examples. Some other things you can comment on and evaluate. Talk about preparation. 
the length of the speech. Was it long enough? Was it too short? As a speaker, those are both qualities we want to, we try to learn how to speak within our time. If we're too long, we're taking the next speaker's time. And if we're too short, we're messing up the schedule that the person who's putting together a seminar may be counting on. And when he's told people to arrive after us. So how's the length of the speech? How about the way the person dressed? Does it look appropriate? How about, are they using any technology? Did it all work? Did the person come and make sure everything worked in advance? Or were they fiddling with things, trying to get it to work at the last minute? Or maybe even as they got up there in front of the group. So those are all things as an evaluator that you can be commenting on. You always want to consider what level is my speaker? If they are a beginner, a novice, their first or second speech, I'm mostly going to focus on nervousness and being encouraging. And I may even, I may mention one of the other items to encourage them, say, here's something you can eventually work on, but it's an advanced technique that you're not being held accountable for yet. And if they're an advanced speaker, I'm going to bring in more of these items that I've described. Whew. That's a long trip we've had. How do we change evaluation behavior? Let's say that you've listened to all this and you go, yeah, I see the value in having great evaluations. I see how I can prepare in advance to give good evaluators evaluations. I recognize my role as an evaluator. I know how to present it. I know what to look for and what to tell them. So now how do you change your behavior and start applying, implementing this improved evaluation? As I say, the first thing you have to do is decide that you want to change. We've done that. I'm gonna assume that we've accomplished that today. Second is we want to recognize the benefits of change. Again, I think we've done that. Now it's your turn. Part three is you put the change into action and perform the new behavior. And then fourth is you have to make it a habit. You can't try it once, ah, I was uncomfortable, or maybe it didn't go so well, whatever. You put the change into habit and you and put it into action and do it over and over again. And now it becomes a habit. If you wanna really get good at it fast, evaluate every speech, not just the, one that you're assigned to, but write down a full evaluation, take full notes and think about how would you give this evaluation to the speaker if you were called on to be the evaluator. And that's, well, that's the kind of stuff I do when I'm preparing for a contest because I want to really test myself against um, with the top speakers. So I'll be doing that at speech contests, thinking how would I evaluate this contest level speech. At this point, I get to turn it over to you and ask what questions do you have that we haven't covered yet? You could either unmute yourself or um, just put it in chat and I'll relay it that way as well. So whichever works best. So if you want to unmute yourself and ask questions, that would be great. And I had one question that I thought might, uh, uh, I'd like to know more about is what do you find as being the hardest part of evaluating for you? And I'll just bring that up. For me, the hardest part is how to write an evaluation speech in this short amount of time that you've got with all the other stuff going on during a meeting and you're trying to write out your ideas do you use any particular format in terms of how you organize it that's probably my hardest part is you know what's my opening going to be what points am yes. i going to make so what are your thoughts i would agree that can really slow you down and get you going down the wrong path that I'm going to take you back to the methods of evaluation. So what I've done in advance is I've already prepared my sheet of paper. I've got one section that says content and another section that says delivery. As people are, as I listen and hear things to put in one section or the other, I put them into one box or the other. After the speech, I start 
I tend to start numbering them. I'll put them in the, I'll put a number in, and circle it in front of each of the points that I want to cover and the order that I want to cover it in. I'll decide if I have too much, what do I want to leave off? Uh -huh. And then I, my introduction is always, thank you, Mr. General Evaluator, fellow members, guests, and especially you, whoever the speaker is. Today, you gave us a speech entitled blah, 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 the purpose of which is to blah, 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 and blah. Today, I'm going to evaluate you on your content and your delivery. First, the content, and off I go. So what's the hardest part? So I've, I feel I've taken steps to overcome what would otherwise be the hardest part. I think the hardest thing to me sometimes is when I have seen something that I feel is not optimal and I'm trying to hurry and come up with a better suggestion. I remember my last division level speech con evaluation contest, I evaluated someone who had been a, not just district governor, um, a, a, you know, I, I forget the word, this happens when you get old, but um, she had, I had evaluated her at the area contest also amazingly. And then at the division contest, her, conclusion was not good it kind of summarized but it wasn't a very strong conclusion i knew there was a better way to do it mm -hmm. and i was hope i was trying to hurry and come up with a way a suggestion so i could say i think this would have been better but i got to, all the way to giving the evaluation and i reached that part of the evaluation and i still didn't have a suggestion. I apologized to her. I said, I feel there, I told her why I didn't think it was the best value, the best conclusion. Mm -hmm. And I felt that something would have been better. But I, at that point, I wasn't ready or didn't have the time to make a suitable suggestion on how I would have done it differently. Just it didn't feel as good as I felt it should have been because it didn't live up to the rest of the speech. So maybe that's the hard, that's the hardest thing I've had to deal with lately. Well, I think you make a great point that sometimes you can't come up with the great suggestion of how they would do it differently, but just to let them know as an audience member, it didn't ring for you, you know, or, you know, that in this case here, the conclusion didn't have the great, the, the amount of whatever it was you were looking for. As you say, my, in a conclusion, I look for or listen for this. I didn't get that. I can't. I can't really think right now what you might do differently, but perhaps get some feedback the next time you deliver such a speech to make sure that the, the conclusion has a powerful impact. I know when I was a member of Master Speakers of Austin, who we've got several of those members on the call, we in that particular club have three evaluators minimum for each speaker. So, and each evaluator focuses on three different areas. One, as you'd mentioned, is content. The other is delivery style. And the third is the impact. Did the speech achieve its goal? Did it impact me emotionally? If you wanted to persuade me, was I persuaded? You know, and that uh, is the three different ways in which we do our particular evaluations in that club. And I think that's a very powerful way to give people sort of an overall comprehensive evaluation. And I would add that, that impact is what I put into the conclusion. Did it accomplish its purpose? Same idea, I think. Mm -hmm. Exactly. All right. Any other questions out there? People might want to unmute themselves or put it in chat. I know we've got, well, we've got about 10 more minutes if you've got the time. So let's see if there are any questions. Somebody usually asks me, what do I do if I hear the perfect speech. Ah, <laughs> yes, that, that does come up. Questions? Are there any other questions? Hmm. Well, that's, the, that's a great point because nothing frustrates me more in a club where someone listens to a, a capable speaker who gives a great speech. It's well-prepared and such, but as a speaker, you always want to know, how can I take it to the next level? 
because perhaps this isn't going to be something that's going to win at a contest. So if I give a great evaluation and you say, I can't think of anything I would offer to have you improve upon, that's not helpful for me. That's, that's, if I'm asking you to evaluate me, I'm looking for you to find at least one or two things. And for any audience member, the uh, one speech is not about necessarily what you say, but about what they hear. So if what they hear wasn't what you meant, so your intent was to convey this idea, but they didn't get it, then that's a valid evaluation. That's a valid uh, point to make back to the speakers is, I really didn't follow you on this or something like that. That's even though well, I, everyone else got it. <laughs> I once had to give an evaluation for an advanced speaker. She gave a 45 minute presentation on her and her husband's experiences in the Peace Corps in Africa, complete with slides and it was perfect. There was nothing I would do different, differently or change to it. It was the perfect speech. And I told her this was the perfect speech. I turned it around instead of saying, here's how to improve. I described what made it the perfect speech. It became a guide for the rest of the club and also for her saying, this is what made it a perfect speech. Basically, I want you to keep doing this and this and this because you did those so well, those such strengths for you continue to do that. And I was almost addressing, usually I address the speaker directly. This time I addressed the rest of the club. Did you notice how she did this? Did you notice how she did this so smoothly and perfectly? So I turned it into less of, of an evaluation on what to do differently, but that type of, of, of an evaluation to recognize the achievement and encourage more of those mm -hmm. and encourage in a way everyone else copying that so that they could have the same level of success. And that's what you can do with perfect speech. And I realize in Toastmasters, we don't get to have a conversation with the speaker because often when someone gives a speech, like if I give a speech in a club and I have a fairly a newbie evaluator and they, and they, of course they're gonna think, I, I can't think of anything I would tell you. Sometimes I, I, I would prefer them to ask, what were some of the things that, uh, that you thought worked or didn't work in your speech? Because when I give a speech, I can list at least five or 10 things that didn't go across the way I had intended or it didn't work as well as I had hoped. And yet they may not have caught it but I clearly caught it. And it's something that's a learning opportunity if they could give that feedback back to the evaluator who says, I can't really think of anything. It seemed like the perfect speech to me. They might wanna say in this, in a more informal way, well, one of the things that I probably could work on more is this, or I really intended to emphasize this. And I don't think I really emphasized it enough. Yeah. Great. Well, I'm, I'm not saying that we have. I have a question. I have a question for Chuck. Chuck, I'm I'm one of master speakers with Bart, and so I'm used to getting evaluations. We do get six per speech, but I'm also in a regular club, and my challenge is convincing the members of my regular club that it's okay to have the courage, as you talked about early on. You talked about how you now have the courage to say what you actually saw. I know that some people in my club see things yeah. and they're afraid to say it. How do I convince them? How do I give them that courage that you described? It's okay to tell me what you saw and what you didn't like or where you got confused because I, that's the only way I'm going to become a better speaker. I know that's a challenge, but I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts about that. I would say it's going to take several things. One thing is you have to always be the role model and show how it's done and let people see that it doesn't break the club. Mm -hmm. It doesn't break the relationship. Another thing is as a speaker, always encourage the evaluators to tell you what they see because you want to improve. So you want them to tell you everything. The other thing that might help and this might be something for you to do and mm -hmm. maybe others will pick up on it there are times when i've wanted to give as part of my evaluation 
a suggestion or maybe a complaint that I feel might not go over well, or maybe I'm not confident that everyone else would feel that way. There have been times where, again, I'm speaking for myself and I would say, I see this. I don't know if anyone else sees that. And I have actually asked the club at that point, if you agree, if you saw the same thing, raise your hand. And then if it didn't bother you at all, raise your hand. That's very powerful because when you see it kind of split or when, let's say you see one heavily one way or the other, you can then go to the speaker and say, um, I think that it affected a lot of people that that's something that overall you have to work on or, okay, it was just me. I know what else it bothered, didn't bother anyone else. So I think you're actually good with it. Just recognize that some of a, a small minority may be bothered by it. The hard part is when it's 50, 50, you say, ah, oh, boy, that, that's a hard way. It, it really interfered with half your audience and the other, it didn't. You might want to practice a different way to accomplish that because you don't want to lose half of the audience, but that might, help them if they feel some that's kind of a an orthodox way to do an evaluation uh, i've had success when i've done that and that might give them the feeling that the permission to go ahead and introduce something they see that they may not be comfortable because now they're either getting broad support or they can say hmm, no it was just me okay i appreciate that chuck i think that's a that's definitely an ideal I'm going to steal. And I think Bart, would, that would go over great at MSA, wouldn't it? We could just, we, we tend to tell each other when we disagree anyway, because with six evaluations, you're going to get some of that. But, but it might be great to open it up to the whole club and say, okay, who agrees with? Last week, it was Stephen and Amy. I mean, who agrees with Stephen and who agrees with Amy? And there are probably things in the middle of that, so that will really help us. So I'll say I've I've run evaluation sessions like this for contest speakers. They'll give up. They'll stand up. They'll give their con their speech, and instead of having one evaluator, I'll just open up to the club and say, "Who saw anything?" Someone will make a comment, and maybe who agrees, who disagrees. Next okay. comment, who agrees, who disagrees. Okay, I like that because that that might work at a regular club. So. Oh, okay. Thank you, Chuck. You're welcome. You make a great make point, a great Chuck, point, that Chuck, it's that it's so important, so important to offer any perspective, any perspective that because any that perspective, that perspective that someone has as an evaluator, evaluator is valid because valid, that's how it that's impacted, how it impacted them, them as one member of the audience. Of the audience. If I'm speaking I'm to an speaking international audience, audience, I may be I may referring be to something to that's very specific to American culture. And yet they may be, they may interpret this in a completely different way because it's not their culture. And I'd want to be more sensitive to who my audience is. So getting from perspective, even though that I might say, well, but you're not from my culture. So obviously you wouldn't get this joke or you wouldn't get this. But the point is, if I'm a speaker, I'm trying to reach everyone I'm speaking to. So if I'm failing to do that to even one person, their feedback can be helpful. Well, do we have any other questions out there? I know we're just about done here. And, and I do want to say very, very much how much I appreciate, Chuck, you bringing your expertise. You have so many years of great experience in Toastmasters and in your training work uh, that uh, I believe that was with, um, was it Phillips or Phillips Petroleum or which? Yeah, with Phillips Petroleum for many, many years. So. So you bring much to the table and I appreciate everything you offer. And I hope that you, you know, there's some other topics you want to bring to the continuing education program that you consider doing so in the future. We're always looking for new topics. And so anyone who's on the call, if there are other topics you want to hear someone to speak about, we're always open to put something into the program that's helpful. And this will be also, since it's recorded, will become a part of our resource library so that anyone can access that, especially people who would want this information and yet they were unable to attend tonight. So given that uh, I don't think we have any other questions, I do want to thank you, Chuck, on behalf of the Continuing Education Program, on behalf of District 55, 
and anyone who might be listening to this recording in the future. So thank you all. And I'm going to conclude by doing something we tell people not to do as speakers. I'm going to thank you for attending because I, as I said at the beginning, evaluations are the most important part of our meetings. They make strong clubs and stronger clubs make my Toastmaster experience better. So thank you for being interested in this topic take it back to your club and make stronger clubs filled with strong evaluators. I strongly believe there's a one-to-one -one correlation between strong evaluations and strong clubs. Mr. I Justin. would agree. So thank you very much, Chuck, and thank you everyone for being here. And we'll see you at the next time. Please do check out our other programs on the continuing education page that is on our tmd55.org website. So thank you all, and we'll see you another time. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.